Welcome to the next installment of our Deep Look public speaker series. I'm James Nye, an Associate Dean and a Professor of Ecology, Behavior, and Evolution in the School of Biological Sciences at UC San Diego. Today, we will be delving into the inner workings of our brains and sharing deep insights into how our minds adapt to change and stress. This program is a follow-on to last fall's Deep Look into Mental Health, in which we examined mental health issues on our campus, in our community, and around the world. You can find that program by searching for UCTV and the Deep Look series. Before we dive in, I'd like to extend a heartfelt thank you to our friends at UCTV, who have been invaluable partners throughout the Deep Look series. I'm thrilled to introduce our three exceptional speakers who have joined us today. Once they've shared their insights, we'll open the floor for a few questions from you, our curious audience. So get ready for an inspiring journey into the depths of our minds. Our first speaker, Nick Spitzer, is a distinguished professor emeritus in the Department of Neurobiology, a member of the UC San Diego community since 1972. He has received a Sloan Fellowship, a Javits Neuroscience Investigator Award, and a Guggenheim Fellowship. He was the founding editor-in-chief of BrainFacts.org and a founding co-director of the Kavli Institute for Brain and Mind here at UC San Diego. His research investigates how the brain changes in response to experience, both during development and in adulthood. Thank you, James, for that kind introduction. Stress is a common feature of normal life. Often it is good stress, um, a challenging kind of stress uh, that allows us to make a positive response. Uh, and this can actually enhance our performance and beneficial. Um, however, sometimes we experience bad stress and this is a threatening form of stress that impairs our behavior. So today I'm gonna to tell you about some recent work that we've done in the lab that uh, has helped us understand the changes that occur in the brain in response to a threatening or bad form of stress. We study neurotransmitter switching in the brain, which is one of the many ways in which the brain changes in response to experience. Neurons communicate by secreting chemicals called neurotransmitters. Transmitter switching occurs when neurons stop making one neurotransmitter and start making a different neurotransmitter. So today we'll talk about how stress causes that transmitter switch in brain neurons and how that leads to changes in behavior. Quick outline here for the talk. First, we'll discuss how stress induces the switch, promotes generalized fear uh, in inappropriate ways, and then we'll ask whether the same transmitter switch also occurs in patients with post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. And finally, we'll talk about how a drug that prevents transmitter switching can prevent the acquisition of generalized and inappropriate fear behavior uh, in mice. So the way we address this is we take mice and we put them in a chamber where we can give them an intense foot shock. Uh, the floor is a metal grid. We pass current through it. It provides a brief shock. Mice don't like it, uh, but it doesn't injure them. Um, the control animals go in the same chamber, but they don't get a shock. And then two, uh, two weeks, 14 days after the shock, we ask whether or not they can explore a novel environment, see how they do. Uh, and here we have two videos. One on the left is of a control mouse. The red spot on its back allows the camera to track. And you see it moves around the chamber here, no problem. Uh, in contrast, the foot shock mouse uh, seen in the, in the image at the right, in the video at the right, it's huddling in one corner. It, it's, it's freezing from time to time, maybe remaining immobile. Then it moves again a little bit, clearly a different kind of behavior. But we can quantify this behavior in very easy ways. Uh, uh, and, and we do this uh, by scoring the distance uh, traveled here. A control mouse, you can see, has wandered all around the chamber. The foot shock mice um, remain mostly in the, in the corners of the chamber. Uh, we can plot the distance that the mice travel in 10 minutes, about 30 meters for the control mice, much less for the foot shock mice. We can score the rearing counts when the mouse rears up and puts its paws on the wall of the chamber. Again, we see much more of that activity in the control mouse, much less in the foot shock mouse. And finally, freezing behavior, this remaining immobile. Uh, and we see that the control mice really never freeze, uh, but the uh, foot shock mice freeze a lot. Uh, so uh, we decided we would look for transmitter switching in neurons in the brain, possibly a basis for this kind of change in behavior. 
And we focused on neurons that might contain serotonin, also known as 5-hydroxytryptamine, 5-HT, because serotonin is the most commonly used pharmacological target for treating fear disorders. And it's well known that the dorsal raphe nucleus, the DRN, is the largest serotonergic nucleus in the brain. Here's where it's located. This is a cartoon of the brain. The front's over here on the left, the forebrain. The back's over here on the right in the hindbrain. The dorsal raphe nucleus is in the midbrain here. Uh, um, and we uh, cut sections through the mouse brain, uh, stained the neurons for serotonin, 5-HT, uh, shown here in green. Uh, in each green spot is, is a nerve cell, a neuron. Uh, it's really rather a pretty image, we think. Uh, it looks kind of like a, a bird, maybe, or possibly an, an airplane with, with wings on either side here, and then a, a body or a fuselage with a tail. Um, so these are the serotonergic neurons that we wanted to study. And so we looked at, to see if foot shock stress would change the the neurotransmitters in these dorsal raphe neurons. Uh, and we started by looking for neurons expressing GABA. GABA is a, a transmitter that uh, inhibits other uh, neurons. It, it think of it kind of like a stop signal in a way. Uh, and we scored the number of neurons that co-express both GABA and 5-hydroxytryptamine. And we see that the number goes up uh, here in response to uh, foot shock. Uh, and in contrast, we saw that the number of neurons making a, a glutamate kind of, we can think of this as a go signal, uh, that number decreased in response to the foot shock. Overall, the total number of neurons, not significantly different, not significantly different uh, as a result of this uh, foot shock experience. We were fascinated when we found that overriding this transmitter switch, putting the transmitters back to the way they were before, this prevented the acquisition of generalized fear. Uh, and we found that the ner switching neurons in the dorsal raphe nu nucleus project to brain regions that regulate fear. So here's our dorsal raphe nucleus. We see the neurons send their processes to the lateral habenula, to the central amygdala, and down here to the paraventricular hypothalamus. So this is the way in which these switching neurons are influencing a fear behavior by signaling to other neurons in different regions of the brain. So then we turn to the question of whether the same transmitter switch also occurs in patients with post-traumatic stress disorder. Just to remind you of our findings, here's uh, a summary of what we found from the mouse dorsal raphe neurons. Uh, in left, we see uh, that in the control mice, about 18% of the neurons in the dorsal raphe express glutamate in green, the go signal. Uh, and that number uh, decreases here in the foot shocked uh, mice to about uh, 9%. Uh, in contrast, the, uh, the, the red uh, uh, neurons here, uh, the, expressing the GABA the transmitter, the, the stop signal, we can think of it, that increases uh, uh, fourfold here from 3% to 12%. We obtained samples of tissue from the NIH bio brain bank. Um, of um, brains of uh, individuals who suffered from PTSD and then died of other causes. Uh, and we also got some samples of, of uh, brain tissue from control subjects. And we studied the tra transmitter expression in these tissues. And we found something very uh, similar to what we had seen in the mice. Again, in the control subjects, a large uh, percent of neurons co-expressed glutamate with serotonin, and that uh, number uh, decreased uh, fairly impressively. Uh, and at the same time, the number of neurons expressing GABA, uh, the, the stop signal, uh, increased um, uh, to a, a very substantial extent. Uh, so this was very intriguing, suggested that perhaps something similar to what we see in mice is also occurring uh, in the uh, human brain in response to a severe stress. And finally, we turn to the question of whether a drug that prevents transmitter switching could prevent acquisition of generalized fear behavior now back in, in mice. And to do this, we uh, study the effect of a antidepressant drug. Uh, many people will probably be familiar with this. This is fluoxetine. It's also known as Prozac, a very effective antidepressant used to, to treat many different kinds of, of mental disorders. Uh, and we put the fluoxetine in the drinking water of the mice. And so at, uh, immediately following their foot shock on day zero, they started drinking, as, as they always do, uh, water in their cages. And, and over the course of the next two weeks, they uh, kept uh, taking on fluoxetine. And what we found was that 
This immediate treatment with fluoxetine prevented the transmitter switch and prevented the acquisition of generalized fear. In contrast, if we waited two weeks after the foot shock and then we started delivering fluoxetine for the next two weeks, we refer to this as the delayed fluoxetine treatment, uh, uh, at the end of the two weeks on day 28, now we uh, assessed the animal's behavior, as you saw in the videos, uh, and then we counted the numbers of GABAergic and glutamatergic neurons in the dorsal raphe nucleus. We found that um, the delayed treatment does not prevent the transmitter switch and does not prevent the acquisition of generalized fear. These findings are very consistent with some of the clinical uh, findings, uh, which are that a, a treatment of an individual who's been subjected to a severe stress uh, with an antidepressant immediately uh, can often have very helpful effects, but the delayed treatment by months or years uh, is generally not effective. So in conclusion, uh, we've seen that the stress that induces transmitter switching reduces active behavior, promotes generalized fear in a novel environment, and that the same transmitter switch also occurs in patients with PTSD. The prompt treatment with the antidepressant fluoxetine prevents the transmitter switching, prevents the acquisition of generalized fear behavior in mice. So at the end, I'd like to thank my colleagues, and particularly Dr. Wee-Chuan Li, who led this project, uh, her students here uh, and the other lab members who provided very helpful uh, criticism and advice throughout the project, our, our collaborators, Professor Don Cleveland and uh, Kong Chen in his lab, and of course, our funding from the National Institutes of Health. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, Andrea Chiba, is a professor in the Department of Cognitive Science and the Neuroscience Graduate Program at UC San Diego. She was the co-director and founding science director of the Temporal Dynamics of Learning Center, a National Science Foundation Science of Learning Center, and is the co-founder of the Global Science of Learning Education Network. Her research focuses on understanding the neural systems and principles underlying aspects of learning, memory, affect, and attention, with an emphasis on neuroplasticity. Her research is highly interdisciplinary and uses a variety of neurobiological, neurochemical, neurophysiological, computational, robotic, and behavioral techniques. Thank you, James, for that nice introduction. Really appreciate it. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I am Andrea Chiba, and I want to tell you a little bit about brain and body systems and the way that we dynamically regulate ourselves um, throughout time and through experience. Often we're, we find ourselves in different settings and um, we may be very relaxed in one setting and then there might be another setting where we feel some situation of overwhelm. Probably everyone sitting in the, in the audience here has felt that state of overwhelm. And um, the way in which different structures in the brain will code the place and the context and the way our brains match the dynamics of the environment differs across time. And so we take each context differently because it's appropriate to behave differently in each context. And context is constructed in space and time, this sort of physical restrictions um, that we place on our own behavior. And we code those with our neural systems at every level of the system. So our system is arranged from the central nervous system, even our connection with others, down to our sensory systems and our maps of the environment and the networks of neurons and the neurons themselves and synapses right down to the molecular level. And what's really interesting is these things are always nested in time and give us an idea of the spatial landscape of the brain also. And so, in fact, if we go from the lower level of a synapse, that place where um, neurons meet and communicate from electrical to chemical information, um, we have temporal scales that organize the dynamics of the brain. And so we may go from the single neuron through to a collection of synapses on that neuron to decide whether it's going to spike or fire or not, to many neurons communicating with each other, 
to whole networks of neurons um, on our cortical surface that we can record in the human as EEG. And we have dynamics in the brain um, that are ongoing and those dynamics need to match our context, what we're doing and what the outside environment is bringing us. And so often we talk about the brain as though it's doing all these things itself, but the brain goes hand in hand with our organ systems. It's just one bodily system. It's not alone neck up um, and it's tightly integrated with the autonomic system. And so every single organ actually gets communication from the brain and it's not unidirectional. It actually dives back into the brain. And we have a series of cranial nerves that allow this. And they're split into the divisions of the nervous system that you may have heard of, um, the parasympathetic division and the sympathetic division, each which has different function. So we think of the parasympathetic division as calming. It slows our heart rate, it stimulates our digestion, it constricts our pupils, and the sympathetic division often gets this sort of um, press as the fight or flight system where um, it accelerates our heart rate, it inhibits our digestion, and it allows our brain to work um, in a different way so that we can escape predators, we can escape dangerous situations. But the truth is, is these systems are always working in balance and they're always working in a dynamic range that allows us to interact with our environment fluidly. So how we do that is non-trivial, however. We may be the same person in three different situations. Take the guy enjoying a conversation with his friends or colleagues in a relaxed setting to the point of overwhelm at work where everyone's giving things at once and he must respond so quickly that he maybe just wants to shut down. It's just too much. To someone that's kind of relaxed, he may be sleepy, but uh, could be in his own thoughts, lost in his own internal state. And you could be one person in these three different contexts and your nervous system is functioning differently in every single context, not surprisingly. And so um, how is it that we do the switch from the external word, world to the internal world? Well, we have a circuit that um, supports our internal feelings or interoception. And so this allows us to actually get all the input from our visceral organs and process it in a way that we can understand our own internal feelings. And we often switch between our internal feelings and the external world quite fluidly, but it takes slightly different states to do that and slightly different processing states. So how do we do that? Well, there's something we can measure from the, from the cortex of the human called EEG. We've been doing this for years. Um, this is a classic diagram by Penfield and Erickson in the 1940s, and um, it gives you recording from two electrodes on the scalp here in the differential, and it's showing the activity that occurs. And in one case, it's someone who's alert, awake, excited, and we see this trace that is low amplitude and very rapid, many, many cycles per second, if we were to draw a line through the middle. And then there's the relaxed state where we have fewer cycles per second um, and higher amplitude. And then there's the drowsy state, um, which is slightly lower amplitude and a few fewer cycles per second. And then the sleepy state that's slowing down and then deep sleep where you have these high amplitude, very slow oscillations. So the cortex reflects actually the state of the neuromodulators internally many of which are balanced by those systems I just talked about, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. And um, we can put our cortex in different states and try to match the state of our cortex to what's going on in the outside world. So if we're in a very drowsy state, we're not gonna be picking up much of what's going on. If we're very excited, 
we might pick everything up. We might be so excited that we miss a lot though, because we're just going too quickly. So these were data that were recorded uh, by Victor Mises in my lab from the auditory cortex of a rat. Now, how are we gonna look at the rat's cortical states and understand anything? Well, we recorded from the auditory cortex while we played a series of clicks. So in the background, first we recorded the baseline activity, the, the rat's EEG, and we looked at the rat um, when they were in a sleepy state. Here we have this kind of slow wavy activity versus when they were in alert or activative state. And then we got a little bit of baseline activity and then turned on a series of clicks. Click, 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 very rapidly. Well, it turns out when they're in the sleepy state, they follow the first few clicks very faithfully. You can see the big uptick, the, the following of those clicks by the brain itself, and then it falls into a sloppy re representation. But then when they're in an activated or alert state, the brain follows very precisely the clicks from the sound in the environment. And so that excited or the desynchronized EEG state, the alert state, is the state at which we could take in the most information and best match our brain dynamics to the ongoing auditory activity from the environment. So for the rats, that was the state for effective coding and um, perhaps learning of these temporal patterns of the clicks. That's an example of how we can have the same information going in the environment, but the state of our brain causes us to process it very differently. And what we take in is very, very different. And so that state of our brain, it turns out, can make us act in different ways also. So say we get very aroused. Um, in this case, we have two rats in my lab and one rat is free to mill about and the other rat is trapped in an enclosure. And rats don't like to be trapped. It's, it's not fun for them, it's mildly distressing. And so they go into mild distress patterns and the free rat, however, has an opportunity to open the door for them. And so here's an example where the free rat runs over and releases the trapped rat. And so that's the good scenario. But what we found in our lab is that if the free rat picks up on the distress of the trapped rat and the trapped rat is too distressed and the free rat gets too distressed, then they won't open the door. What happens is they go into an overactivated state. So they have too much sympathetic nervous system involvement as though they too are being trapped or in distress. And actually the higher the distress, the less likely they are to actually help the other rat. So these states, these cortical states, these brain states we put ourselves in can really massively impact our behavior. And so the key here is how do we maintain a balance that's appropriate for the context at hand between these divisions, if you will, of our nervous system? Well, the efficacy of these nerves, and this is an old drawing of just one of those nerves, the vagus nerve, which goes through to the body, all the viscera, and dives back in the brain right into those structures that are involved in interoception, both the amygdala and the insular cortex. And if you will, communicates the state of the body to the brain. So the state of our body can massively impact our brain and vice versa. And the efficacy of these nerves actually impacts how well we can regulate our calming or parasympathetic behaviors and our sympathetic behaviors. And so they become very important. And so the way we feel activation with respect to alertness, kind of being in the sweet spot of processing the outside world versus um, going over that hump to anxiety, it can go from low to high um, activation 
with respect to the sympathetic nervous system. So it can go from sleepy to stressed and that impacts our performance. And so we have an adaptive purpose to this, these feelings we feel inside, our emotions, our, um, the state of our cortex, and they're designed to induce motivation, to spring us into action when needed, to actually lower our sensory thresholds. We saw an example of that. We saw an example of the rat's cortex actually processing the outside sounds better, facilitate learning, enhance memory, and it modulates like who will approach, who will avoid, whether we're responding to a context appropriately, whether we're going to help or not. And the arousal associated with all these emotions facilitate performance to a certain extent, unless there's so much arousal, it shuts us down. And that may prevent us from helping, prevent us from functioning. And um, it may be a state where we're really not as um, effective, which could be adaptive. It could be time for us to actually relax and regulate. Or it could be maladaptive where there are long, long chunks of time when we simply can't function well. And so um, I wanted to uh, sort of end the conversation there and thank my laboratory for all the nice conversations we've had over the years that have sort of led to this perspective of thinking about the balance of aspects of the nervous system and processing the external environment and our internal state in the world. Um, that impacts whether we're going to help, whether we're going to sense, and just about everything else. And um, also thank our funders, NSF, NIH, the Kavli Institute here, and our T. Denny Sanford Compassion Institute. Thank you so much, everybody. Our final speaker, Karen Dopkins, has been a professor of psychology at UC San Diego since 1995. Although her background has been brain development in children, her most recent research focus is in the area of mindfulness and mental well being. In 2015, she revamped her lab to become the Human Experience and Awareness Lab, HEA Lab, which studies the human condition that is, when, why, and how humans flourish instead of floundering. This applied work uses rigorous methods and analyses and is critical in an era when depression, loneliness, and anxiety run rampant. Thank you, James, for that warm introduction. One of the things that my lab studies is emotional resilience. So I'd like to start out with an audience and say, raise your hand if you have a practice in place to take care of your physical body. Like maybe you do yoga, you, or you run, you lift weights, or you make sure you get to bed early every night, but you're doing something to build your physical resilience. Again, most people raise their hands and say, yes, I do that for myself. But then when I ask the audience, what practice do you have in place to build emotional resilience? They get confused. Like, what do you mean a practice? And what do you mean by emotional resilience? So let me give you the definition of emotional resilience. What is it? It's the ability to accept and learn from uncomfortable situations and emotions. And another thing about emotional resilience is that it's about letting emotions process at their own intelligent pace. So what do I mean by that? Well, if we talked about blood circulating throughout your body, it turns out that it takes about one minute to do a full circulation of blood through the body. And of course, blood is bringing nutrients to your organs and removing waste. It knows what it's doing. Likewise, if we talked about your digestive system, it takes about two hours to digest food. It's doing what it knows to do, and it does it at its own pace. And it would be kind of crazy to kind of be, come on, blood flow faster, or come on, digestive system, you know, digest my food faster. But when it comes to issues of the heart, the metaphorical heart, we seem to think that we can control it and rush it along at the pace that we want, as opposed to trusting it to work at its own intelligent pace. And so here it is. What is that pace? Well, could be one minute, could be years. You're at a, at a coming up to a light, you're running late and you miss the green light and you don't like that. It doesn't feel good. You kind of flare up emotionally, but you kind of, huh, all right, can't do anything about it. Light's red. It is what it is. One minute to let that process. Other things take years. Losing a, a loved one can heal 
very slowly. You can heal from that. It can take a long time. So um, some background, as you know, from James' introduction, I'm the leader of the HEAL Lab, the Human Experience and Awareness Lab. And everything that my lab focuses on has to do with the human experience. And to give you a little bit more information, we uh, specifically focus on interventions to improve human experience. So some of the interventions might be meditation or journaling or disclosing information to get it up and out. Well, around the same time that I revamped my lab to be the HEAL Lab, I also created a course on campus called Learning Sustainable Well-Being, Compassion for Self and Others. And I created this course because I saw the depression, anxiety, and loneliness on the rise in the students. And I have to say, I think a lot about humans and I think about the evolution about, of humans. And it's kind of remarkable that almost all humans on the planet agree that young people deserve a free education, a public school education. And it's also amazing that almost everybody on the planet agrees on roughly what the curriculum should be. So we teach students math and science and literature and history, et cetera. But what amazes me the most is that we've never thought about the idea of a course for young people on how to be a human. It's like, where do you get a course on how to have a good relationship with yourself and others? And so I wanted to do something about that. So I created this course, which I teach twice a year at UCSD. Class is always full to capacity. And I also teach it uh, to private groups in San Diego and around the world. The course is 10 weeks, a total of 16 hours, and it's an experiential course on how to be a human. So it's not academic, it's experiential. And I like to describe the course as being about preventative mental health. Many of you know that the American Medical Association decided that a good way to treat disease is to focus on prevention of disease. And so a lot of the things that the medical field does now is, is teach people how to take care of their bodies so that they prevent the disease from happening. Preventative mental health is the same idea. So instead of waiting for people to reach a breaking point in their mental lives or a crisis, breakdown, take your pick, Give them the skills that they need early on in life so that they know how to have a good relationship with themselves, so they know how to have a good relationship and good communication with others. When I teach this course, Learning Sustainable Wellbeing, I usually have an opener like this. Maybe It may seem obvious, but here it is. It's hard to be a human. Why is it hard to be a human? Because humans are in a predicament. And the predicament is... Like animals, we are selfishly motivated, but as humans, we have a responsibility to behave with right action. How do we balance these two things? So let me focus on the animal side first. Like animals, we are selfishly motivated. We have the same motivational systems and fear systems as animals that are all there to make sure that we survive. So if I put down a plate of food, in front of three hungry dogs, what would happen? Do you think they would go, oh, no, no, after you, your turn? No, of course they would all, every dog for himself. The dogs would go at the food, me, 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 I want, I need. Now, imagine that I did the same thing with humans. Imagine right now I put down a plate of food in front of all of you and you hadn't eaten all day. Of course, you'd act civilized because we've learned to act civilized. You wouldn't just go for it but all of your motivational systems inside you would want to go first. And you know, some of us kind of like, just kind of walk fast towards the table. Oh, I'm not trying to go first, but you are because you want that food in you. And it should not be shamed because it's part of it. It's a natural process of being an animal. But humans are in a predicament because we're trying to balance that with what we know is the right thing to do. So how do we acknowledge the animal side while living with integrity, grace? and resilience? And the answer is we have to practice. So just the way we get our bodies in shape by going to the gym and practicing and building resilience in our muscles, we have to do the same thing with the metaphysical heart. And we use lessons from Eastern and Western philosophies. And those lessons are from mindfulness, cognitive approaches, and positive psychology. 
And this slide is gonna give you kind of a whirlwind tour about all of these approaches. And I like to couch them with respect to your relationship to your thoughts and emotions. So here you are all day long with thoughts, feelings, and most emotions bombarding you. Very natural, thoughts, feelings, and emotions are bombarding you all day long. So let's talk about mindfulness first. Mindfulness is about non-attachment to and full acceptance of thoughts and emotions. Now, those two things, non-attachment and full acceptance, might seem like an oxymoron, but I guarantee you they're not. And if you take a course in mindfulness, you'll realize that you hold both things to be true, full acceptance of your experience, but without attaching to it, without ruminating on it, without trying to nail everything down and have certainty all the time, which is what we humans love to do. And I think if I were going to capture it in a bumper sticker, and I've seen this in a bumper sticker, it would say, don't believe everything you think. That's what mindfulness is. Understanding that we have very noisy minds that go all day long, but we don't have to attach to everything that we think. Cognitive approaches, which is from cognitive behavioral therapy, is about exploring and challenging the thoughts and emotions. So you get very good at posing some very logical questions to yourself so that you can suffer less. And finally, positive psychology, which is about changing the thoughts and emotions, being careful what words you choose. So an example that I like to give is that about 15 years ago, I decided that I was not gonna use the word busy anymore. People say, how have you been? I go, oh, I've been so busy. I don't wanna use the word busy. Busy sounds negative. It means that I've taken on too much. So a positive psychology spin on that is when somebody asks me how I've been, I say life is full or life is rich. So this is the course that I teach, which has two components, your relationship with yourself, your relationship with others. And here are some of the topics. I'll just flash them up so you can get a sense of what we cover in the course about your relationship with yourself and then your relationship with others. And I will let you know that in a few days from now, I'm teaching a two-day intensive of this, of this workshop down in the gas lamp area of San Diego. Um, it's at Park and Market. You can sign up if you're interested. Anyway, emotional resilience is what I'm going to home in on for the rest of my talk. So how do we learn to practice emotional resilience? Or how do we learn to hold our emotions? Like I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big fan of metaphors. So sort of imagine yourself holding your emotions. How do we do this? I think it's useful to tell you what emotional resilience is not. So right off the bat, I want to tell you that it's not about grit and sort of toughing it out and endurance. Now, endurance is a wonderful human characteristic, but it's not what emotional resilience is. It's a different kind of thing. So let me tell you a few other things that emotional resilience is not. It's not about hiding, denying, or distracting yourself from your emotions. It's not about going out and drinking so you can forget your sorrows. Your sorrows are in there and they have to be honored. It's not about getting over your emotions quickly. Like I said, emotions process at their own intelligent pace. It's not about controlling your emotions because all of these methods that are not emotion resilience, all of these hiding, getting over them quickly, controlling them, all of them have been shown to lead to physical illness. In other words, bottling up your emotions and pretending that they're not there, they come out somatically in some other way. Stomach aches, headaches, you name it. So not a good idea. So bottom line here is don't try to control your emotions. Don't do it because they're there, they're informational. They're, you need your emotions. They're giving you important information. But please do control your emotion-driven behaviors. And I feel the need to say this because sometimes people misunderstand and they say, well, if all of my emotions are good, good, well, I'm just going to act them out. I'm mad. I'm going to throw things. No, no, no. Because behaviors hurt other people. They can hurt other people. So the emotions themselves can never be shamed. They're inside you. They're real. They're informational. But yes, please don't act them out because you can hurt other people. So what is emotional resilience? understanding that emotions are impermanent experiences and they are not you. Let me explain what I mean by that. When you say, I am anxious, I am anxious. That's not true. That's existential. You are not anxious. You are not this thing called an emotion. 
you are experiencing anxiety. So getting used to realizing that it's not that I am anxious, it's that I'm experiencing anxiety in my body and it's not going to last forever. It's impermanent. It's about accepting all of your emotions, especially uncomfortable emotions. And it's about noticing emotions in your body, which is called interoception. And I think you might've heard about that from Andrea already today. Um, to contrast it with exteroception, which is sensing what's happening out in the world through your eyes and your ears and your nose and tongue and touch, interoception is about noticing what's going on inside the body. So emotions in the body, wait, what? Emotions are in the body? I never heard that before, you might be thinking. Well, emotions are constellations of physiological changes in the body, just to name a few, body temperature, heart rate, breathing rate. And these physiological changes come together in a particular pattern that we then label with words like sadness, anger, and joy. So all of these things in green are sort of the mindfulness approach to emotional resilience, kind of a deep acceptance of and non-attachment to these things that we experience all day long, thoughts, feelings, and emotions. In blue are items that fit under cognitive approaches, and I'm going to name two. So the first one is intentionally making yourself uncomfortable. What? Why would I do that? Well, because you value something like connection. So you're at a party where you don't know anybody, you want to connect, but it's a little scary to go up to people and introduce yourself. But you do it anyway, because you teach yourself through collecting data and seeing what happens that nothing bad is gonna happen, that I can do this. I'm going to force myself to do something uncomfortable, introduce myself or give a public talk or take your pick so that you can get, get over the fear. And it's a little bit similar to immersion therapy. For example, if you were afraid of snakes and they put you in a cage of non-poisonous snakes so that you can really learn that it's okay, get over your fears by facing them. The next category is one of my favorites, questioning your underlying assumptions. Humans make a lot of assumptions and it causes a lot of suffering. If I had a dime for every time somebody said to me, oh, he said that to intentionally hurt me, I'd be rich. And whenever somebody does say to me, oh, he says that because he's trying to get me upset, I look at them and I say, wow, how do you know that? You must be a mind reader because we think we know what other people are intending and thinking about us and we don't. So having a little bit of humility and, and possibly some curiosity, like, huh, I wonder, I wonder. And if you ever really want to find out, what somebody meant when they said something, ask them. It's the only way to really know what they meant. But instead we run around with all sorts of ideas about what people meant. So the cognitive approach is stopping, slowing down and asking yourself a very simple question. Like, do I actually know that somebody said that to hurt me? I don't know. And then the last category in orange is under positive psychology. And that's like practicing positivity. So mindfully writing out a gratitude list of all the things that you appreciate in your life, taking a moment to slow down and think positively or experiencing joy in the body. Joy lives in the body, you know, whether it's singing or dancing or meditating or, you know, just running and moving your body, feeling joy bubble up. And all of these things, whether mindfulness, cognitive approaches or positive psychology, all of these practices help face adversity. And that's why they're all under the topic of emotion resilience. So that's the end of what I have to share today. Uh, thank you for your time. And I will be happy to take questions in the question and answer period. Thank you. Well, thank you, Nick, Andrea, and Karen. That was really thought provoking and fascinating. Um, this is a time for everyone to ask their questions. And we have some questions that I have that um, I thought of based upon your talks and what other folks have put in. So I guess I'm going to begin first with one for Nick, thinking about what 
Andrea talked about in terms of the evolution of these self-regulatory systems. There is an adaptive value to stress and fear, and of course we have to control that, but I'm wondering in your mouse system, is there a way that you can get a sense of what is the correct level of antidepressants that you can give that still enables them to have that adaptive value of stress, but also keeps it from getting out of hand? Well, that's a great question, uh, James. Uh, we haven't uh, addressed that yet, but it will be a fun uh, direction for us to pursue. One wants, of course, to uh, hit that peak that Andrea uh, uh, showed us, uh, uh, where we're optimizing our performance. Uh, and uh, I think that's a concern with all drugs, uh, uh, certainly with the antidepressants. Thank you. That's great. Um, Andrea, I, I was really um, thinking about what Karen was saying about the importance of empathy and grace in humans and, and what we're striving for. And in that particular example where the rats got overstressed, um, could that be an example of a rat feeling empathy? Is that something that researchers can talk about? And is it possible that excessive empathy could actually be harmful? So it's hard to talk about empathy in rodents. Um, but one thing my graduate student, Emily Winokur did was actually look at co-distress. She went frame by frame and looked at how one rat was mirroring the other's distress. And so in humans, you would take that to be an empathic response. And it seems like if you are, if you can't regulate out of that distress, you begin feeling that distress as your own rather than realizing that self-other distinction, it becomes very hard to drive out of the stress to take action. And it puts you over that optimal or the sweet spot of um, being able to take motivated action. So I think, yes, um, being overly empathic might actually prevent mm -hmm. us from um, regulating appropriately and, and taking positive action, which is why I think the topic of regulation, all those skills that Karen's trying to teach are so important. Great, thank you. Um, just to mix it up, Karen, we have a question from online and I'll just read it. If you're experiencing anxiety attack or feel like one is coming on, what strategies do you have at that moment to prevent this attack? Is there a cure for anxiety attacks? So there's several approaches. And the first one that comes to mind really harkens back to what Andrea taught us which is that the parasympathetic system is there to slow down your body. And so it was taught to me a long time ago that when your heartbeat is racing, which is usually what accompanies anxiety, you slow down your heart by activating your own parasympathetic system. And one of the tricks of that is deep, slow breathing. So that when you, when your body gets the signal that you are slowing down by taking deep breaths, everything gets activated in the parasympathetic system to slow down the heart as well. So that's a quick one. It's a, it's a little trick, right? Andrea, does that sound about right? Okay. Yeah, definitely. Especially if you're paying attention to that breath. Right. And then the other thing I like to ask people to do is start asking anxiety, some questions. And so this is the cognitive approach of the kinds of skills that I'm teaching, which is you need to slow down to ask yourself things like, is there a threat in this moment? Because when the anxiety system gets turned on, it's acting as if there's a lion chasing us. And that's exactly when the anxiety system should come on. Your sympathetic should turn on really fast if you're being chased by a lion. But modern humans have that system turned on when there's no lion, and that's really bad for your system. So like even just asking some questions, like is there actually a threat right now? And seeing that the answer is like, well, actually, no, there is no lion. And then getting good at asking some deeper questions, like what's really driving this? What is the sort of the core, what's the gremlin, as I call him, saying to me that's getting me out of whack? Because it's usually something almost like subconscious level that you're saying to yourself. And if you could slow down enough to go like, what is it that I'm saying to myself that's getting me all uh, you can start to ask it some questions too. And I don't want to hog up too much of the question and answer time. So you're, I'm happy to you know, talk to people after this is over. That's great. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions online. So I'll, I'll do one here that anyone can feel free to jump in on. Are there any studies on how these things affect people with ADHD 
from the stressful situations to the type of medication and how emotional regulation could help. Are there any studies or any links you could suggest for future reading? I gave one example of um, how we regulate, how we take information in from the outside world by matching our cortical dynamics or the oscillatory activity in our cortex to what's needed to sample the outside environment. So we might be very activated if things are coming at us very quickly, for example. And if you don't have the proper neuromodulators present, like acetylcholine, norepinephrine, the catecholamines, it's really tough to get your cortex to that point because that's what happens. Uh, subcortical structures go ahead and dump these neurotransmitters in cortex and change the state of the cortex. And so that's part of the reason that some people take pharmaceuticals so that they can have uh, higher circulating levels of these neurochemicals. Um, but if you don't, there are various ways um, to learn to activate your cortex because um, there are a variety of factors like stress, et cetera, that may uh, change your activational state over time. Um, so it's, it's kind of a complex issue, but that's a start to the answer. And Nick probably has um, some more to say on that too, because he studies some of these transmitters as well. Certainly, we are appreciating that uh, transmitter switching is more, much more pervasive than we had previously understood. Um, and the, I think a, a, an important future direction for neurobiology will be to focus on uh, non-invasive ways to try to uh, switch transmitters back to their original state. Uh, this is, for me, very exciting to be part of our presentation today because um, uh, with Andrea and Karen, you, you see also a, a, uh, an effort to work from the outside in instead of uh, going in directly into the inside and trying to uh, affect the, the outcome uh, behaviorally. So this is, a, this is a great direction for the future. Thank you, Nick. And actually a follow-up question from online. Are there alternatives to drugs to dealing with traumatic experiences that would also suppress GABA? What do you think? I do think so. Uh, we think that there are, and this, this harkens directly back to uh, uh, Karen's uh, uh, positive uh, thinking, uh, the, 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 the psychological importance of, of positive thinking. Uh, we can direct our thoughts uh, in appropriate ways. And what we're finding now is that that can actually have a, a, a powerful effect on the biochemistry of the neurons in the brain. Uh, so uh, this is a, a wonderful new understanding. Can I can I add? Can I hop onto that? So I come from a different approach, which is that trauma needs to be deeply honored and released, um, and not sort of distracted. So there's a lot of work I could tell you about it later, or people doing some very deep traumatic release work, where people have to actually go in and find that place that's very uncomfortable and actually do the act the the release work of it. Yeah, it's another saying, avenue. I could hop on that. Too. Yeah, I think on. one of the interesting thing that goes across what both of you are saying is that part of what happens with our behavior is cues um, begin to drive our behavior. So uh, we we don't realize in life that there are all these different cues that get us to do things. Um, my husband sitting down at the table might be a cue for me to eat, for example, even if I'm not hungry. <laughs> um, and and so sometimes we don't realize how much. Uh, these cues trigger our behavior. And a lot of people have trauma triggers too. So I think part of the experience is um, identifying what those triggers are also. And, and that's probably part of the process that Karen's talking about and part of what Nick's talking about too, I think. That turns out to be very important, as you know, Andrea, for, for drug abuse, uh, where uh, various environmental cues can trigger a relapse uh, and return to uh, uh, drug use after a, a, uh, some freedom has been obtained. Uh, so very important. Thank you. We, so we have uh, one question, and I think this could go to Karen. How does nutrition affect or inform cognitive and emotional function? Wow, that's to me. Okay. Well, I mean, it, I, I guess it could be to anybody, say, actually. I mean, all I'd say is that, you know, these kinds of questions have been addressed for many, many years from different, different disciplines. And there's so much, you know, there's so much out there. I mean, there's a whole um, 
avenue of research on drugs that, uh, sorry, of, on foods that promote inflammation and how inflammation, especially it can get into the brain can be very damaging to you cognitively. I haven't actually looked at that research very well. I know it's out there and some people believe in it very strongly. So I would read it carefully if you think that's, if you want to look into it more, but I don't know, maybe Nick and Andrea know about that infl inflammatory work, foods leading to inflammation. Yeah, certainly in animal models, there's been a, a great deal of work uh, and, and and all the way from worms uh, um, to mice uh, and other uh, model animal systems. The question, of course, becomes with the more complicated physiology of the human, how much of that is immediately translatable to our condition? But is, the, is that work in animals about inflammation, in particular foods that, that increase inflammation? Yeah. Some of it is, Karen. Some of it is. Some of it relates to, um, you know, longevity and mental health and other aspects. Uh, um, but but some of it is related to inflammation. Yeah, there are particularly a couple of pathways um, where the gut can wage inflammation in the brain through the gut-brain axis, yeah. particularly the insulin growth factor pathways and the TNF-alpha pathways. Why do they call the gut the mini brain? Like that, is that sort of why they do that? Is they call it the mini brain because of the connections to the brain? There are more neurons in the enteric nervous yeah. system than there are in, 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 in the uh, central nervous system, apparently. This is an understudied field, but as <laughs> yeah. Andrea pointed out, um, there's a lot of signaling back and forth uh, yeah. uh, with, through the vagus nerve and others. Well, we just have about two minutes left. So I wanted to see if any of you had any final thoughts or comments that you would like to leave with our audience. Let me say this is a, there's never been a, a, a time in our very busy lives in the 21st century when it was more important to understand how the brain and the mind work. And it's wonderful to see the rapprochement here between biological approaches, very invasive, very, very specific, and the holistic approaches of cognitive sciences and psychology really integrating now to provide a new set of, uh, of, of solutions for us. Yeah, I have something that... Um... I wanted to pick up on in Karen's talk also that I thought was a very important take home message. And that is um, thinking about creating programs where people are educated from day one <laughs> on many of these things. You know, we have physical education programs. We don't have like brain or mental health education programs and, and the two go hand in hand. And so I think it's sort of time to stop segregating those and make sure we, we teach people. Yeah, I mean, I was I could just echo that and say that it, you might find it interesting that I am trying to scale up these kinds of classes that I teach because the students desperately need them. I I would start it in kindergarten, but I don't teach kindergartners, so this is my community. And I think if we can get these courses started at the college level, that's something. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Please remember to join us later this year for future Deep Look events, which we'll be announcing soon. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank, thank you. you.